Okay, so this is a female reproductive disorder. Uh, the way I'm splitting up the reproduction, of course, is that there's going to be female and male. I'm also going to, this is a pretty big one. Uh, it is my um, um, bread and butter, because me being an obstetrician gynecologist, so uh, I could answer a lot of questions about this stuff. Um, the female reproductive disorders is also going to cover the um, uh, normal, pr oh, I'm sorry, uh, pregnancy disorders along with uh, gynecological or just women's studies, uh, and also breast uh, diseases. When I do the male reproduction, it's going to obviously cover all the male stuff, the prostate uh, diseases and so forth, but also that's where I threw in uh, sexually transmitted diseases. So uh, you'll get that in the male uh, reproduction. All right, so let's talk about the female reproductive disorder. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, the female reproductive disorders. So this is how I kind of broke it up and look at the overview of gynecological and pregnancy diseases. First, we're going to talk about menstrual disorders. Now, keep in mind, before we even do any of this uh, female reproductive uh, diseases, and pregnancy for that matter, you need to make sure you know the menstrual cycle in and out, okay? The first, I don't know, 30 or 40 slides of this PowerPoint presentation has, as usual, all the normal stuff that you should know prior to getting to the diseases. There's no reason to understand what abnormal EKGs are if you don't even know what a normal EKG is. Likewise, there's no reason why you can get into menstrual disorders or pregnancy disorders if you don't know what the normal um, hormone levels are supposed to be throughout the menstrual cycle. So make sure you have a good handle on that stuff over there. Like I said, what you need to know is the first, like I said, I, I, I don't remember the first 40 or 50 slides. Um, uh, of this PowerPoint and I'll do that. If you need more information because that's not enough, I kind of like skimmed over things, then that's what you've got to use your anatomy physiology uh, textbooks for, okay? So anyway, uh, menstrual disorders we'll cover first, then we're going to get into uh, the uterus, so uh, going uh, actually into the cervical disorders, and then we're going to get into uterine disorders. So the cervix is the opening, the doorway to the uterus. The uterus is also the layman, we call it the womb. Okay. Then we're going to talk about ovarian disorders, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about infertility. Uh, I chose to put it in this because we've got to deal with pregnancy too, which is the opposite of pregnancy. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit of male stuff here. Um, and then we're going to get into breast disorders, uh, and then finally we'll get into pregnancy disorders. So that's basically how I broke up the, uh, the gynecological and pregnancy disorders over here. So uh, just a few things we should know. Uh, coitus is just a fancy word for sexual intercourse. So if we have something like something called postcoital bleeding, which you'll see uh, often, postcoital bleeding, post meaning after coital sexual intercourse bleeding. So this is bleeding that occurs just after sexual inter intercourse. Okay. We also have something called dyspareunia, which is a fancy word of having painful, painful intercourse. We're going to talk about certain things in there. If there's an infection going on over there, that can cause a lot of pain, okay, uh, of one thing. But there's also other things that can cause that, vaginismus and all, okay? So let's get into some of the menstrual disorders here, okay? So the normal menstrual cycle, just is just a quick uh, highlight of what it is. The normal menstrual cycle um, is 28 days plus or minus 7 days. I know a lot of people have different ones, but it should be anywhere from 21 to 35 days. On average, we say a 28-day cycle, okay? Demenses, menstruation, the amount of blood loss should only be about 30 to 80 milliliters per cycle, per cycle. Now, when you look at something like this container here, and this is 8 ounces, so this is 237 milliliters, this is way over the amount over here. We're looking at probably close to three times the amount 
of 80 milliliters is in here. So we're looking at basically in one cycle, you should lose about one third of this bottle. Okay, just so you can see what that is. Um, here's a um, for the camera, so you can see over here the narrow bottle. This is just the blue covering on here. Okay, so for my where my finger is on the bottom to here, that is just about five and a half inches. It's about here. Sorry about this. So it's five and a half inches. So we're looking at one third of this bottle. Very little amount. That's in one cycle, not per day. Okay. Um, if there's blood clots, then that's suspicion that you're having too much. Now, the reason why we're getting uh, blood clots is think about what's happening here. You're sitting down, and you're having a trickle of blood that's coming out of the eyes or the, the opening of the cervix, and it's coming out. Now, it should be less than 80 milliliters for a whole cycle. So we're taking five days, and you're breaking up, uh, what is that, uh, roughly, what, 15 to 20 milliliters per day, right? Something like that or so. Um, so, you, so if you have something that's going to be more than 80 milliliters, then the blood is going to be coming out of the cervix, out of the, the womb, and when you're sitting down, that is going to, your vagina is going to be filling up with blood, and it's going to fill up and fill up, and it's going to coagulate, okay? Because it's sitting there like you're sitting, you're sitting in a chair. Then when you get up, you have a blood clot that comes out because it was getting bigger in the vagina. Does that make sense? Okay. So if there's blood clots, that is not normal because you're doing more than 80 milliliters per cycle. Now, don't get me wrong. Does that mean that, oh my God, I got to get checked? Not necessarily. If you are having clots and you can do your normal daily activities and you're not getting too weak because of the blood loss, and you're happy with that and you're used to it, then continue doing that, okay? But I don't want you to think that clots are normal. We can fix that. It more or less m might be just because of a hormonal change that's happening. Their hormones are out of whack. Maybe there's a fibroid uterus. We don't know. So that's where you have to do a workup to see what's going on, okay? The last menstrual period is the date of the first day of the last time you bled. Okay, so what does that mean? All right, so what happens here, let's say your last, your menstrual period, let's say this is January, and you have, I'm just gonna give you numbers here, you bleed on day one, then you bleed on day two, day three, day four, day five. Then there's no more bleeding until day, uh, 29. Okay? Does that make sense? Right? 28 day cycle. I'm talking about normal cycle. Okay? So you have 29, this is January, 30, oops, sorry, 30, 31, and then you're going to have February 1st, 2nd. And now let's say you go visit the doctor on day 15. Uh, not day 15, but February. So this is now February. So now you see the doctor on February 15th. And the doctor asks you, when was your last menstrual period? Is it January 1st, January 5th, January 6th, January 28th, January 29th, February 2nd, February 3rd? When is your last menstrual period? Last menstrual period is the first day of your last menstrual period. So if you said January 29, that is the date of your last menstrual period. Okay? Does that make sense? A lot of people get confused. That's why I'm spending some time on this. A lot of patients... Uh, when you say when your last menstrual period, you're not going to get the same answer all the time because they have a different definition in their mind of what the last menstrual period is. They may think the last time, the last day that they bled was their last menstrual period. And that's going to change things if they have to figure out why you're bleeding heavy or if you're pregnant and so forth. So it is very important to know what the last menstrual period is. 
So I don't ask patients what your last menstrual period is. What I ask is simply, when was the first day of your last menstrual period? Now, just asking that precise question, you're always going to get the same answer. Or, not the same answer, but you're always going to get the, their mentality of what that last menstrual period is. Does that make sense? So I want you to get used to when you talk to patients, because the average mind of a patient is usually, in terms of medicine, is not much higher than seventh grade. I'm not saying anything bad with that, that they don't know all the terms. They don't, they're not in nursing school like you, or a medical school, or any kind of medical professional school, so they don't know all these different terms. So you've got to talk to them in their language, and then you translate it on your documents. Does that make sense? Right? So I always ask, what was the last, or I'm sorry, what was the first day of your last menstrual period? So always, if this on the 15th, if you say it this way, they should always say the 29th, if this is their menstrual cycle, so to say, right? Okay? Then on your documents, you're going to put LMP equals January 29th. Does that make sense? You've got to be precise about that. Okay? So questions about last menstrual period? I spent some time on that because I uh, may have a question on that or so, but that's very important because you will be asking that um, in your... Um, in your fields, okay? Okay. So, let's talk about some abnormalities of the menstrual cycle, okay? We have a word called dysmenorrhea. Dysmenorrhea is simply just saying painful periods. Now, I'm sure that uh, if you women in this classroom or you know some women, uh, mom or sister, whichever, who had this, okay? Or currently have this. Dysmenorrhea is painful bleeding. What it means is that because there's prostaglandins, there's that big word again, prostaglandins that get released from the uterus during the menstruation. And the prostaglandins causes pain. So what would you give to someone, a painkiller, that would decrease the amount of prostaglandins so that you won't have the pain? What is a prostaglandin inhibitor that we talked about before? Aspirin. Okay? Aspirin is a prostaglandin inhibitor. Okay? Um, it also prevents the platelets from sticking with each other, preventing clots. Aspirin is one of the oldest medications. It's been around since I think like the 1500s um, that we're still using today. It has so many good properties and so many bad properties, right? We could also cause um, uh, acid-base disturbances with that. We could have peptic ulcer diseases. There's a lot of things, but there is some good features to that, okay? Um, also, you could use Motrin or ibuprofen. All of that is prostaglandin inhibitors also. They're the same category. We call them NSAIDs, right? Non-anti-inflammatory NSAIDs. Uh, I got to draw it up here. Uh, so it stands for non-anti-inflammatory, oh, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We call that NSAIDs. And that could be aspirin, we usually abbreviate aspirin ASA. Um, that stands for acetosilic acid, or better known as aspirin, same thing. It could be Motrin. All right, it could be ibuprofen. Okay, there could be a, there's other NSAIDs that fall into that category too. So, or other uh, medications fall into NSAIDs. All right, so those medications should decrease uh, prostaglandin release. So, people who have dysmenorrhea, we usually prescribe some sort of Motrin, or at least um, tell her to uh, get some Motrin or ibuprofen. Okay. Um, it causes uh, peptic ulcers, so we also tell them to make sure you eat it with a sandwich or something, so that when there's acid that comes out because of the NSAIDs, we'll talk about that later on, but when that comes out, you want it to eat away at the food that you just ate, not at your stomach, all right? So it'll cause upset stomach. Amenorrhea means without a menstruation, okay? We'll talk about those later. Um, 
hypomenorrhea or an, an oligomenorrhea. Hypo means a decrease amount of menstruation. Oligo means a scant or a very little amount. They kind of mean the same thing, okay? So this is when your blood flow is less than 30 milliliters uh, per cycle, okay? Um, so that's what it is, all right? So that's what that means. We have menorrhagia, and this is where we're going to have an increase. This is where your clots are coming in. This is going to have an increased amount of menstruation per period, per cycle, in other words, okay? And then we have metarrhagia. And metarrhagia is that when you have periods, you also have some bleeding in between the periods. So it's kind of like out of sync, okay? So this is bleeding between periods. And one of the more common um, uh, symptoms that we're seeing or conditions is something called menometarrhagia. I know it's kind of weird. But metametrorrhagia is basically a combination of these two over here. They have heavy bleeding and they're between periods. So they can't, because they're in between periods, it's difficult to see when their last menstrual period is. They're just bleeding so heavy on and off, on and off. And we see that a lot, okay? We've got to try and figure out why this is happening. It could be because of hormonal imbalance, could be something organic. Cancer, could be fibroids, we have multiple different things. So we have this functional uterine bleeding, also referred to as DUB. Okay? Um, this is the reason that females seek gynecological help. This is the most common reason for this. In other words, there's something going on with their menstrual period. It's out of sync. There's, I, I want to have a regular period so that I could expect when the period comes, but there's something going on. I'm getting, you know, periods now lasting eight days. Um, they're heavy, or maybe, you know, like I just had a period four days ago, but I got another one now. What's going on? And so it's, it's out of sync. Something's not right there. So we have this sporadic menstrual bleeding without a true period. So they want to be put on some kind of um, routine, okay? It usually occurs with anovulation. In other words, the, uh, the egg doesn't ovulate, doesn't pop out of the ovary with something like this. There's no identifiable anatomical reason for this. It is hormonal. So usually with something like this, we need to rule out everything else. That the uterus is fine, the ovaries are fine, that there's no infection, that there's no, um, sexu well, with that sexually transmitted disease, um, that we got. Once we've ruled out all the organic stuff, now we can say it's hormonal. Now, once we've ruled out all the organic stuff, now we can say it's hormonal. And if it's hormonal, we put it in a category of DUB. So if you have no ovulation, that means the corpus luteum is not formed. If there's no corpus luteum, then there's not going to be any progesterone that's coming out. Okay? You're not going to any, get any help from estrogen. Uh, you're not going to get any help for estrogen from progesterone to thicken the endometrial lining. So the endometrium is not going to be very thick. If it's thick, you're not going to have a bleed. But right now, you need estrogen and progesterone to do that, to make it thick. But if you don't have progesterone, now the estrogen is just going to be there. It's going to be, scant, it's, it's, it's going to be thin in certain areas, which means it's going to slough up. It's going to bleed. Okay? So the endometrium never reaches full thickness stays very thin, and the endometrial thickens somewhat, and then it sheds off. So it's just a very fragile lining that just comes off. We want it nice and thick. And when you see the menstrual cycle, which is, if this doesn't make sense to you about corpus luteum, progesterone, estrogen, you need to go back. Stop this video now. You need to go back and understand what a normal menstrual cycle is with all the different hormones that affect that. Once you have a good handle on that, now this stuff will make more sense to you. But if, you, if it makes sense to you, super. Go forward. Okay? So that's what goes on over here. The treatment for something like this is give an oral contraceptive pill. Okay? Now I know um, what happens here is that when we hear OCPs, oral contraceptive pill, you're thinking, oh, I got to get this pill because uh, I got to stop my pregnancy. Mm -hmm. I'd rather call these pills hormonal pills because there's so many other uses of this, this type of pill than the usual stop yourself from getting pregnant, okay? This is actually going to put your body into a normal menstrual cycle. 
it's going to give you the estrogen and progesterone that normally would be in your cycle throughout the 28 days, and it's going to put your hormones back into track. Right now, they're out of whack. They're, they're imbalanced for some reason, okay? Um, so what happens is this will actually put that back on track. Now, a lot of times, we do this for, let's say, four to six months, the body has now seen, oh, this is what you want. It's almost like you're training your body with the proper dosages of these uh, medications. And then after about four to six months, if you take you off the medications, your body has, has now been put uh, kind of like a restart, right? Uh, a restart for your, your hormones. And it kind of puts that in situ back to what it normally should be. Um, other times, they might need to be put on for a year or longer. Um, but we usually give it like a four to six trial period or something like that. Okay. So this is just showing you again. Um, here's your uterus over here. Here's the two fallopian tubes. Let me use this. So here's the uterus. Okay. Here's the two fallopian tubes with the ovary. There's the other fallopian tube with the ovary. This is going to be the vagina. And here's the cervix, which is really the opening to the womb or opening to the uterus itself. This is the cervical oz, the basically little opening. This is where blood will come out from the lining of your uterus. Okay, it'll sit in your vagina, and then it'll come out on the pad or whichever you use. Okay? So that's what it would look like. Now we have something called endometriosis. Endometriosis is basically endometrial tissue that's in an abnormal place. Now, endometrial tissue is supposed to be the lining of the inner lining of the uterus. Okay, but for some reason, some of this tissue is in other areas that it shouldn't be. We call them ectopic areas. It could be in the fallopian tube. It could be in the ovary. It could be in your abdominal cavity. Okay. Uh, let me go back to this picture over here for a moment, all right? So what we have is inside the uterus, you have the lining of the cavity, the endometrial lining that you usually would shed off, okay? Then you got the fallopian tubes and the ovary. Now, this is not really showing it well, but there's the ovary and the fallopian tube themselves are touching each other, but there is no, um, there's no fusion of the two. So in other words, some of the, um, how do I put it, the ovary will shoot it up normally, would ovulate, and let the egg go into the fallopian tube. But there's a possibility that that egg may go out into the pelvic cavity. Because there is, it's basically, here's your ovary, and here's the, and, the, and my arm is like the fallopian tube. So it's like this, but... They're not fused together. So there's really like a small gap there, so to say. So the egg would, can come out here, and there is fingers on there, believe it or not. And those fingers will kind of like move it like this, so that the egg, when it pops out, it'll actually be vacuumed into the fallopian tube. Okay, does that make sense? Now there's some theories, let me go back to this thing. There's some theories about endometrial tissue that doesn't, goes downwards, but instead it goes upwards. So, I'll be drawing this picture quite often. Um, we have this uterus. Here's the vagina. This is your cervical eye, so the cervix is this. Then we have the two fallopian tubes. This is the ovary. Okay? And the fallopian tube has an opening here where fluid can go back and forth, right? So let me just draw this so you have an understanding of what's going on here. A penis goes in the vagina. Now the sperm is able to go through the cervical, through the cervix, the oz over here, into the uterus, and goes into the fallopian tube. Okay? The ovary is going to release an egg, goes into the fallopian tube, so now the sperm and the fallopian tube, I'm sorry, the sperm and the ovary, 
the, sorry, the sperm and the egg will unite in the fallopian tube, become a zygote, and then it's going to flow back into the, the uterus and implant onto the endometrial lining. That's how normal pregnancy happens. Okay? So this is your endometrial lining, what I'm doing here in red. This is the part that during menstruations, that will get very thin and shed off, and that's what, and, and there's blood vessels there that open up, and that's where the bleeding comes in. What happens here is that for endometriosis, there's a few theories about what, what causes this, or what actually happens. But one of the ones that they do is that some of this tissue, for some reason, is supposed to go down here. That's where it's supposed to go. Right? Drip, drip, drip. But some of the tissue itself ascends and goes into the fallopian tube. Some of it will seed on the ovary. Some of it will seed, because it moves out, and seed places in the pelvic cavity, or even on the uterus itself. What happens here is that during menstruation, this will come out, and then for nearly a month, 20 days, you don't have the bleeding, right? And then you have another bleeding. Now, you're going to have bleeding in this place, but here's where the problem is. This starts bleeding too. These areas that are out here, they're going to start bleeding. And in your pelvic cavity, any blood that sits in there causes pain. It irritates the area. Because blood should not be there. And that starts irritating it. So now what happens is when they have menstrual, uh, menstrual bleeding, people with endometriosis will have severe pain in their pelvic cavity. If it's on the uterus itself, I'm sorry, on the ovary itself, it could obliterate the, the ovary itself. And that's not good because that's where all your eggs are coming from. A lot of times these will form what we call cysts, and the blood may not come out of the cyst, but may sit in there. We put a scope in there to take a look at it, and we rupture it. The fluid that's in here is blood, but it looks very chocolatey, like that, that thick uh, chocolate syrup kind of thing. So we refer to these as chocolate cysts. The other thing that happens with blood, besides all this pain that happens, blood scatters all over here, and what happens is it goes on the fallopian tube, or any organ in here, and kind of pulls the, in this case the fallopian tube pulls it up, it kind of contracts it. It sticks there, and it pulls it up. These are what we call adhesions. The stickiness that's happening from all the blood causes adhesion, adhesions. Adhesions is scarring that happens with two organs um, and sticking together. If it happens in a fallopian tube, you see why this would cause infertility. If a sperm is going to go this way, it might not be able to get into that tight opening that's over there because it's being pulled. It's kinked. The egg, which is bigger than the sperm, will pop in here, but it can't get through there. So now, we're not going to have the, unite, the, uh, the sperm and the egg united because they have all these adhesions because of the fallopian tube. But keep in mind, you do have your intestines all around here, right? And you can have adhesions happening over here, too. If that happens, this will be pulled. And that can cause constipation, right? Because now the stool is going to have problems getting through that narrow opening and so forth. So adhesions are pretty bad. It's scarring between organs. Okay? Now we could go in there and we could cut those areas. But the funny part is, or the ironic part about this, is that surgery can also cause adhesions. Any place you cut 
can actually fuse together in an abnormal way. So it's kind of a catch-22 with that. We've got to weigh the pros and the cons. If the pain is so severe, if they have infertility that's, that's really bad, um, or constipation, or other things, then we weigh the pros and the cons. You know, yes, we could do surgery, and it's going to cause some adhesions, but let's, we need to do something because you can't be in this pain like this. So we kind of weigh the pros and the cons of what's going on there. Okay? The question is about endometriosis. And this is just kind of showing you some places you could see endometriosis in the ovary, which is the most common place that we're going to see endometriosis, because that's the first place that the, that the endometrial lining is going to touch. It's going to be the ovary. So we see that very common. But we can see it in the uterus or in the pelvic cavities that you can see over there. Okay? So that's endometriosis. Okay, some more pictures of that. Okay, this is what adhesions would kind of look like. And you see some seedings all around here. And here's our chocolate cyst that kind of ruptured. That will cause a lot of pain. Okay. So we can also have menstrual disorders that's related to psychological disorders. Okay. So we can have something called premenstrual syndrome, right? We've heard of that before, but what is it all about, okay? It occurs a few days, as the name implies, a few days prior to menstruation, okay? So we're looking at day 26, 27, 28, something like that, when you look at a 28-day cycle, okay? And it's usually due to high levels of estrogen, estrogen and progesterone, all right? It will, these hormones will affect the serotonin and neuro, um, neuroepinephrine in the brain. The neurotransmitters there. Certain ones will actually cause depression and so forth. Uh, you get these mild mood changes, um, fluid retention, you got this bloating that goes on. Estrogen will do that because estrogen has more like an ADH-like effect to it. it kind of, uh, not ADH, aldosterone. It looks similar uh, structure-wise. Estrogen and, and aldosterone do that. So, Sodium will get reabsorbed with that. Um, breast tenderness, because the progesterone is going to fill the, um, the breast with milk. And they get, the, the milk gets produced, it won't excrete, but what will happen is they get so swollen that they're going to um, uh, cause a lot of tenderness, a little pain. Okay? We also have something called premenstrual dysphoric disorder, okay? And this alters the neurotransmitter in the brain even more severe. Now remember, this is more of mild mood changes that happen over here, okay? But basically what happens with a premenstrual dysphoric uh, disorder is that you get more heavy things in terms of uh, de really bad depression, anxiety, poor concentration on doing things, okay? Uh, eating and sleeping disturbances, uh, they get pains in their breasts, of course, uh, more than what you would get over here. Joint and muscles also get this. All right, so that's what usually happens with, with that. Okay? Then we got menopausal senescence, and this is more menopause. Okay? As a woman ages, the follicles start deteriorating. It starts to use up all the eggs. Okay? Um, so if you use up all the eggs, you're not going to be able to produce any estrogen. And if those eggs don't ever ovulate, then you're not going to form a corpus luteum, which means you're not going to have progesterone secreted either. Okay? So when you decrease estrogen and progesterone, that's going to send negative feedback to cause an increase of FSH and LH. So I kind of did this before when we did the endocrine disorders, but I'll show you again over here. Um, we have the hypothalamic pituitary target axis. I think I did this with your um, with the thyroid disease diseases, but now I'm going to do it with how it relates to the female reproductive system. So what happens here is that Hypothalamus is going to release a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone to tell the anterior pituitary to release another hormone called FSH, but also LH. 
and that's going to tell the ovary to release estrogen and cause ovulation, so you're also going to release progesterone. Okay? Good. So what happens here, normally, is gonadotropin gets released, it tells the anterior pituitary to release FSH and LH, that's going to make the ovary release estrogen and progesterone. So this will go up and up and up. And if this keeps on going up, it's going to send negative feedback to the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus to decrease this, because we have too much estrogen and progesterone. So we've got to decrease this, and if we decrease these two, then this estrogen and progesterone is going to decrease. Does that make sense, right? Little axis stuff, right? Now if this gets too low, and the negative feedback goes on again, and now we're going to increase this. Now what I'm talking about with menopause we have. So basically, the ovaries are shot. So their estrogen levels are going to be very, very low. And progesterone also. There's no more progesterone coming out. Now, estrogen does come out, but not so much over here. Where else are we going to see estrogen come out? In other words, a 90-year-old woman doesn't have an estrogen level of 0. 0.0000. It's going to be 0. 0.0. One, two, something like that. But the ovaries are shot. So where is that other estrogen coming from? Remember androgens? Where are they coming from? Androgens are the precursors of testosterone. Androgens come from the adrenal cortex. Okay? So from the adrenal cortex, you're going to get androgens that's going to make testosterone. Well, to break up testosterone, that's going to turn into estrogen before it becomes cholesterol. So technically, we do get estrogen, a small amount, and testosterone for that matter, from the adrenal cortex, the so-called androgens that come over there. But a person who's got menopause, okay, we are going to have a decreased amount of estrogen, but we are going to have, if this is very low, we're going to have negative feedback, and the, high, the FSH levels, LH levels, and the GnRH levels, are all going to increase. There's nothing here that's going to decrease this because we don't have any of the estrogen and progesterone anymore. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what's happening with that. All right. And signs and symptoms, they have amenorrhea. In other words, they won't have a menstrual period. They may have hot flashes, bursts of, uh, of this FSH that comes out of the anterior pituitary. Okay. They burst out, and it kind of basal dilates blood vessels, usually at, um, at night. So when you have these basal dilation, it's all of a sudden this warm blood just going into the brain, uh, a big burst, because you're opening up those blood vessels. So all of a sudden, they have this warm blood going right into the brain, and it's like, whoa, it's a hot flash, right? That's what's happening with that, all right? You also get vaginal and breast glands that start uh, atrophying, um, so that's what's going to happen, okay? The perimenopause cause of the estrogen is, is so uh, low right now, okay? The perimenopausal period is a time around menopause when periods first become irregular or, or, irregular or light, okay? It takes about, in other words, what's going to happen is you're going to have like a, a period in January, no period in February, no period in March, but then you get another one in April, you get another one in May, but then you have two, so it's, it's, it's all scanty. Does that make sense? It's kind of like um, uh, at the end of popcorn, right? When you go, uh, when you pop popcorn in the microwave, at the very end, it goes pop, 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 right? So that's what happens with, um, um, with the, during a uh, perimenopausal state. We call it postmenopausal once you have no period for one year. Then we say that they're in a, a postmenopausal state, okay? So what causes menopause? Like I said, if all the eggs are depleted, the ovaries shut down. If the ovaries shut down, you are going to decrease the estrogen and progesterone. And that's what causes it. Okay? Males don't have an equivalent to menopause. 
Some people might say, oh, he's going through a midlife crisis. That's his menopause. Technically, it's not because menopause deals with FSH and LH levels. So when a male, or female for that matter, goes through a midlife crisis, their hormones of FSH and LH don't change. So it's not really the same thing, okay? All right, so let's talk a little bit about amenorrhea, okay? This is without a period. This Okay. So amenorrhea is we can have either call it primary or secondary amenorrhea. This is without a period. Primary amenorrhea refers to no menses by 14 years old and no puberty. What I mean by no puberty, the breast buds, we call them buds, when the breasts start developing, okay? Or there's no growth spurt. So that's when we say there's no uh, puberty there, okay? Or there's no menstruation by 16 years old, but puberty has occurred. Their growth spurt happened, um, the breast buds did happen, but there is no menstruation. So we refer to this as primary amenorrhea, okay? Some uh, reasons for this, it could be a chromosomal abnormality, something called Turner syndrome, or there could be something wrong with the uterus or vagina that there's no blood coming out. So there could be some kind of anatomical reasons for that. So they develop, um, so they may not have the breast bud or the growth spurt, or they may, but we're looking at the, the age difference, 14 versus 16, okay? So that's primary amenorrhea. But then we also have secondary amenorrhea, and this is when we have no menses after with going a normal menarche. In other words, you had a menstrual period, you went through all the normal stages of um, puberty, um, but now all of a sudden you're 21 years old, you've had for the past 10 odd years or so, you've had um, uh, menstrual periods all throughout, but now all of a sudden you don't, you miss the period. The most, um, the most common cause of that is obviously pregnancy, right? Okay? But believe it or not, stress is number two, and people overlook that one, all right? So it would be very common for you to take my course in, course in pathophysiology and realize, you know what, for six months I haven't had a period. No. Um, but these are reasons that uh, you need to look into. Pregnancy number one, stress is number two. Then there could be also chronic intense exercises. Uh, athletes have this kind of thing. Uh, eating disorders, uh, poor nutrition, menopause. Think of what I just talked about with menopause or pre-puberty. Um, thyroid disease can cause this, breastfeeding can cause this, drug abuse can cause all this, all right? So this is when you normally had a menstrual menstruation, but for some reason, many years later, you just don't, okay? 